three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 398. That's a ridiculously high number. I uh, can't believe we've come that far. Two more till 400, which is so many episodes. Um, it's been a weird week for me. A week where, like, I've, I've been super busy the entire week doing stuff like crazy. But creative work is slow, and it's taking a while, and a lot of the stuff I've been working on isn't done, which is, like, deeply frustrating. Uh, a lot of, I know, the next episode is basically mostly done. I got to prepare a little more, but it's, like, pretty much done. I'll add, like, Thursday Night Football to that and put that out hopefully Friday morning. I think I'm going to do another episode Saturday, plus I did an interview yesterday, doing two more later today. Like, I, I have... A ton of content, it's just brewing. And it's like, ah, man, I, I hate when it's... Uh, being patient is really frustrating for me. Uh, now, one thing I did, one reason why I'm behind schedule today is I've been negotiating a deal with a big sponsor. And it's a sponsor that has potential to make some really big changes here on the show that I'm like very, very excited about. And uh, if it all goes through and they accept my proposal, they like my idea... Then it would give me, and I think not only give me more access to do, to like to to certain people. It will also give me the ability to make way bigger content stuff I've never been able to make before. That I'm like, oh, like my ideas and my dreams might come true. So I'm really excited. Uh, it's been well worth the time it's taken this week. Couple days, like ah, I'll, I'll, I don't mind losing a couple days here and there if it means that, like, I think I think what's going to happen in February and March for this show, if this stuff works out, is going to be amazing and you guys are gonna love it i'm gonna have so much fun making it and uh man that's why i do my job is i, I want to make content that i like love and i'm proud of and i can't wait to share with people so uh i also gotta say like i because of that like i it was it was kind of hard to I, I was watching the titans bills game for this episode and it it was hard to like for some reason and i got great stuff to say about the episode about no, the, about that game uh but for me it was so hard to like get through that game it's very weird i was like having all these conflicting emotions. And I really, what I want to watch is the Chargers and Ravens game. I'm watching that immediately after recording this morning. Uh, why I have an interview and then I'm talking to myself. I want to start with a correction today. Richmond wrote in, he said this, Richmond says, long time, first time. Thank you, Richmond. Welcome. He says, Coach O finally got fired. Kind of. After going 500 since 2019, all the legal stuff from not reporting allegations and his seeming lack of focus on Football this year, it was only a matter of time. It was only a matter of when, excuse me. Who do you think LSU will hire? Everyone I've seen mentioned already has a job in a good position. I think Jimbo Fisher, who not only has a good job, but also got screwed by LSU when they chose last mile. So, yeah, Ed Orgeron, the LSU head coach, got fired, but they're going to let him finish out the year. Here's why this is a correction uh, and, and why I wanted to read this. And we'll talk about who I think they should hire. But first, I want to say... Uh, last episode, I didn't have the whole story. I remember literally saying like, I don't know entirely why he was fired. And I was, I try to be honest about that stuff. Um, now we know why. And I, I did more digging and I got a lot of feedback from the audience. People like, Hey, this, this, that apparently the guy, uh, there's all kinds of stories of him enjoying his status as a celebrity head coach, chasing women, inviting them to practice. Like, frankly, really unprofessional stuff that I, I'm actually surprised that they're keeping him through the end of the year based on what I've heard. I mean, apparently he tried to, I don't, I, look up someone, I think a booster for LSU. There's some story there. You can look it up. I'm not going to get into it. That's not football stuff. Uh, remember though, Ed Orgeron did win a national title in 2019. I guess that is what will keep him there and why they're keeping him through the end of the year out of respect for the fact that he won them a national title. Uh, again, it's it's rare a coach gets fired so quickly after winning a national title like Ed Orgeron did with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and Joe Brady. Joe Brady left, Joe Burrow left, Jamar Chase left, Justin Jefferson left, and they were like, oh, well, maybe when we're left with just a coach, there's nothing here. Uh, and again, like, they've been losing a lot, which is part of why he got fired too. Uh, but, but really the main thing, it sounds like there's a lot of off-the-field drama that I, I was not aware of because I don't – that closely follow LSU football. So interesting stuff there. Here's what I want to talk about though. Who should LSU hire to be their next head coach? 
I saw someone sharing an idea. I don't remember who it was. I, I would I would like to think it was Coach Dan Casey, buddy, friend of the show. Uh, I, I think it was Dan Casey talking. I think it was somewhere on Twitter. Someone put somewhere. It's not just my idea. Someone else said this too, and I want to. I wish I could remember who it was because I want to give credit where credit is due. But basically, the idea was that we see coaches at lower level programs, FCS schools, for example, Eastern Washington, Sam Houston State. And those coaches find a way to win with way fewer resources than a, a school like LSU has, where you have, uh, you know, you have small staffs, you can't pay your coaches very much, you have weaker facilities, you have fewer scholarships. And if a coach can figure out how to win at Eastern Washington or Sam Houston State, then hey, they must be doing something right. Because then what ima- imagine what, so I, you know, Aaron Best is a coach at Eastern Washington. He went to a national title. Uh, a couple years ago, and um, you have Casey Keeler at Sam Houston State, another coach that comes to mind, who both of them have been to national championships in recent years. Sam Houston State won the FCS national title last year. And when you take a great coach from a lower level, like a team like at Eastern Washington or Sam Houston State, imagine what they could do with the resources of an LSU who has – incredible facilities, a ton of money. He can pay coaches. He can basically have everything he's always wanted, like no limitations. It's like, again, I'm talking to a sponsor who I'm trying to, I've got an idea. I'm pitching to a sponsor right now. And I'm like, Hey, look, I want to make this video. I can't make this video without your money and your help. And let me tell you with resources, you can do way more. And like, All your dreams can basically come true. All the stuff you've thought about doing, you're like, "Ah, I've always wanted to do that, but I couldn't because of this barrier. If you hire a guy like Aaron Best or Casey Keeler from Sam Houston State, you're giving them way more resources than they've ever had before and an opportunity to maybe achieve their wildest dreams. So I I don't know if that's – I don't think those guys are on the table, but that's an angle I wanted to take with who should LSU hire or something that – no one really talks about, which is, if you do really, really well at a lower level, why could you not do better with better resources at a better program? We often see guys get hired out of, you know, uh, frankly, like, and I guess college football looks at it as if you're at, you know, we saw Lane Kiffin at Florida Atlantic. That's a lower level program than where he's at now, Ole Miss. And well, if he could win at Florida Atlantic, imagine what he can do at Ole Miss with better resources. But it's rare to see big programs dip even lower down to the FCS level. We've seen a couple guys from North Dakota State go and coach at massive programs in college football, but it's I want to just share that idea like, huh, let's all collectively think about that for a moment. You can take a coach from a lower level who's found a way to creatively problem solve and win down there. Imagine what that guy could do with the resources of a program like LSU. I think of Aaron Best. I think of Casey Keeler. Two coaches who come to mind who've done a fantastic job. I've been to Eastern Washington many times. I've got a lot of friends on that football team. I I love it there. That ain't LSU. Like, if you can get recruits to go there, which, you know, Cheney, Washington, God bless it. Man, I can't believe people, anybody goes there to play football. When you look at the rest of the conference and who else, Montana's awesome. They've got Sacramento, which is warmer. You have... Portland State, I uh, I wouldn't want to go to Portland State. I lived in Portland for a while. My point, though, is that what Aaron Best has done at Eastern Washington, what Casey Keeler has done at Sam Houston State, problem solving. Imagine what you could do with more resources like a team at like LSU. Uh, sorry, that was I probably a bit redundant. I, I tend to repeat myself when I get ranty and excited. I have another correction. Uh, it's also in the college football world. Two episodes ago, I was sharing my excitement for this weekend in you know or or as for nfl for college football week seven i was talking about byu who was about to play ranked baylor and i said something along the lines of like i would love to see byu join the pac-12 apparently there's already news i totally missed and didn't see hey zach dingling you're stupid uh byu already agreed to join the big 12 Oh, that's very, and I, I got really excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I, I didn't see that. I knew they were talking behind the scenes. I missed the, the step when it went from they're talking about maybe joining the Big 12 to now it's official. That's big time, man. I, I think I personally look at the BYU football program and see 
nothing but potential. I am not Mormon. I'm not really even religious. But I don't know how you can't acknowledge what they have going on at BYU. They've got a massive fan base that's global. They have a uh, the, going, joining a conference would legitimize BYU. And by the way, the people in the Mormon religion, I'm so, like, let's say it out loud. They tend to have money. Like, so they they travel well and they buy uniforms and they, they will go to games and they will support. And I, I think the Pac-12 missed out on a really big opportunity here to land a, a program that has a ton of potential. And I think of what BYU can achieve as part of the Big 12. I wish it was a more prestigious conference. But look, Oklahoma State, Maybe I think Cincinnati's going to join, uh, but I think BYU is the team that we could see take a big step forward and potentially dominate at um, in, in the Big Twelve. Now, does the religion affect recruiting negatively? I don't know, but I, I know that man, there's certainly a lot of potential at BYU, and I'm very, I it's like a science experiment. I can't wait to see what happens, and I think that what could be achieved at BYU as a member of a conference that helps legitimize them, like. Like, let's be honest. I mean, just money, fans who care, and, uh, you know, a, a schedule they can win. They can dominate some of the Big 12 schools they're going to play. So I am very interested and very excited to see what happens with BYU joining the Big 12. Okay, uh, let's jump into Monday Night Football. On Monday Night Football, the Tennessee Titans beat the Buffalo Bills 34-31. to 31. Most of what I have to say is about Tennessee uh, that's why I want to start with Buffalo. We'll do Buffalo, then we'll talk about Tennessee. I'm torn here because, on one hand, this feels like a really, really bad loss for Buffalo. They lost on Monday Night Football. It was a game that was winnable that the Bills couldn't finish. And I, there's little details that cost Buffalo from winning this football game. And, and by the way, Tennessee's secondary is already bad, then got injured also Caleb Farley, their corner. Uh, a rookie got hurt towards ACL out for the year, but he missed a lot of the game. Uh, left tackle Taylor Lewan for the Titans got a concussion, did not play the entire second half. And, and Buffalo couldn't take advantage of either the fact that their secondary is weakened or the fact that their left tackle wasn't playing. That's a big deal. And like it, the Titans were not at full strength, and yet Buffalo could not leverage that into a win. So if you want to read into that as a big red flag, oh, Buffalo's not going to be able to win a playoff game. Like, you can if you want to. Uh, there are certainly a number of key plays where Buffalo did not do well enough to win those plays. And they got stopped two times on the goal line early in the game. Uh, they had to settle for field goals one on the five-yard line, once on the 10-yard line. There's a third and goal that's stuck in my head where Josh Allen had Stephon Diggs open in the end zone. And missed him. He threw an inaccurate throw. And that should have been a touchdown that would have won them the game. And that's the difference right there. So I'm torn because Buffalo lost a clearly winnable football game. But also on the other side is, well, if a couple plays go their way rather than the way of Tennessee, Buffalo would have won. So I, I, people want to make big, loud statements. And I know my show is called Strong Opinion Sports, but... Sometimes the strongest thing you can say is kind of there isn't a black and white answer here. And now the big controversial thing from this game was that Buffalo found themselves. The situation was fourth and inches on the two and a half yard line with 22 seconds left down 34 to 31. And Buffalo decided to go for it rather than kick the field goal and tie the game. They said, no, nah, we're going to go for it on fourth and inches Quarterback sneak, we want to win. And I have an opinion here. Uh, like I said, sometimes I think the strongest thing you can do is share both sides. And I, I think strong opinion sports, most people think that means pick a side. But if I don't believe in a side, I'm not going to pick it, which we can disagree. I think that's actually strength to say, hey, this side makes some sense and that side makes some sense. Maybe that's moderate opinion sports. And I, I don't know. Uh, but I, no doubt people will get angry you know, after the outcome was decided, whether you go for it on fourth and inches and miss, or you maybe you kick the field goal and you miss, as long as Buffalo doesn't win that game, half the audience is going to be mad no matter what happens on fourth and inches. And what happened was Buffalo went for it. They did not get it. Josh Allen ran a quarterback sneak and got stopped. But I don't want to be too harsh here because sometimes you make a call and you make that decision and it doesn't work out. 
no matter what decision was made, again, you kick a field goal, you go for it. If the outcome was negative, half of the audience is going to be mad and half is going to say, well, it's the right call and whatever. And it's all a giant what if to me. This whole, uh, there's been a conversation all week of should the Bills have kicked the field goal down three points, 22 seconds left on like the two and a half yard line, or was it right to go for it, try to get the victory? Does anyone ask the question, what if they missed the field goal? We've seen crazier things happen where sometimes NFL kickers, the moment's too big or you get a penalty, something happens and you miss a chip shot field goal. So this, this whole conversation, what if would have happened? Well, they lost and it's unfortunate, but accept it and move on. I have no deep like rage or a lot of people like were outraged. I can't believe they went for it. And I just don't have that in my heart. I'm like, ah, well, they, they didn't, they went for it. It didn't work. I, I probably would have kicked it. Let's be clear. I look at it as well. I, I, what I didn't like was the quarterback sneak, I guess, really. Fourth and inches, you're on a quarterback sneak with 22 seconds left. What if you get it? You still got to score a touchdown. So Buffalo wasn't trying to get a touchdown on that play. They were trying to just get the first down and buy themselves a couple more downs. But you have only 22 seconds left. So even if you run a quarterback sneak and get a first down, you still got to score the touchdown. You could get stopped and end up kicking a field goal anyway. If the outcome is you might end up kicking a field goal anyway, then why not just like, why not kick the field goal, tie the game, go to overtime? You got a better quarterback. You probably win in overtime. I don't know, man. Uh, but again, the Bills went for the win. They didn't get it. It happens. They came up inches short. And I think you just got to learn to move on. And I, I kind of have seen messages I've gotten all week and been like, I don't, I don't really have the heart for this conversation. It just... You made a call. It didn't work out. Now, to me, I was surprised Tennessee won this game. I view Buffalo as a Super Bowl team, or at least a Super Bowl contender. There's like five teams in the West, or in the AFC, and five teams in the NFC that all have an opportunity to win the Super Bowl this year. I, I think Buffalo is in this Super Bowl conversation. And what this game did, you know, watching Tennessee beat Buffalo, started a conversation in my head. I'm like, how good are the Tennessee Titans. Like, huh. And then I'm like, well, they got dominated by Arizona week one. But their left tackle, Taylor the one was playing hurt, clearly was not at full strength. He got dominated by Arizona's pass rush. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I can't really explain their other loss. They lost to the New York Jets. And uh, I, I, the one thing you can say, I guess, is that the Titans' corners are not very good. And I, the game, now that I think about it, was in London. I'm pretty, I'm like, 99.9% sure. If I'm if it wasn't in London, you can look it up. But I'm pretty sure that game was in London because I got a bunch of messages about it. Like, I watched the game. I literally read a thing on Ask Zach last episode. I think someone's saying, I was at the game in London. So, yeah, they lost to Tennessee. There's our Tennessee loss to New York in London. That affects your game for sure. Like, playing across the pond is a little bit difficult. Maybe that explains why they lost to the Jets. Again, the Titans' corners are not very good, though. And they gave up some really big plays to Jets' rookie quarterback, Zach Wilson. So we say, hey, left tackle hurt week one. You lost in London to the Jets with you know, your secondary is awful and that it just happens. Still, though, after six games, Tennessee is four and one. And they're probably a playoff team. So they deserve some level of respect. I, I don't think they're clearly like Tennessee is not garbage, right? <laughs> like, I, I, just not true. Now, the corners are a big problem. The secondary in Tennessee is just... Ugh, it's uh, it's bad. It's it's really like they they are a mismatch for a team like Kyler Murray and the Cardinals. That's another reason why they lost so bad week one is Arizona has fantastic receivers matching up with a secondary in Tennessee that's just not very good. And then the passing game is still lacking in Tennessee. Last year with Arthur Smith, I was like, ah, they still need to progress a little bit. Here, here's what I will say though: it's still early with the passing game in Tennessee. They're still working on chemistry. And remember, you have a new offensive coordinator in Tennessee this year, Todd Downing. Plus, they traded for a stud receiver, Julio Jones. And Julio also has been hurt and missed it some time, like two and a half games, basically. Got hurt during week three. So I believe it's reasonable to be patient with the Titans passing game. They're still building chemistry and figuring things out. Fair enough. Uh, they're figuring out how, how do all these parts work together. You got a new... Got an offensive coordinator learning how to play calls for the guys he's working with. Uh, re adding Julio Jones, getting a new offensive coordinator, but adding Julio Jones 
really does change all the dynamics. Like, who do you target on third down? Both from a play-calling standpoint and if you're Ryan Tannehill, do you get one-on-one coverage? A.J. Brown or Julio Jones, who are you targeting? Like, you, you have to figure out who you have better chemistry with. And right now, he probably would go after A.J. Brown, but you don't want to leave Julio Jones on an eye. Like, it's interesting. And Ryan Tannehill is figuring out timing with Julio Jones, learning his style, what he's good at. What ways can I target him? I think he's learning I can really throw a jump ball to Julio Jones and Julio can bring it down. So I, I want to say we're only six games in and the Titans offense is still growing and developing. Give it time. Let's be patient. We'll see where they're at in. I mean, we have 11 games left this year. We'll learn a lot about Tennessee throughout the next 11 games, but I'm not ready to say like, oh, Ryan Tannehill. Like I've seen a lot of people say Ryan Tannehill is horrible and he had a, a miss on third down. He missed A.J. Brown across the middle. He threw the ball high. Uh, maybe it was A.J. Brown or Julio Jones. Had one of those two open across the middle, missed him high. I'm like, ah, that's a key miss you can't have. But then also, down the stretch in this game against Buffalo. And, and really, you can say this every time Ryan Tannehill takes the field in a football game. Ryan Tannehill is weirdly clutch. It's like a, It's a true thing about him that third down and fourth down in the second half in overtime, he always finds a way to make the right play, whether that's running for four yards on third and three, diving for a first down or making a great read, throwing the ball. Like he actually does a lot of stuff with his legs. It doesn't get appreciated. So I am not comfortable saying Ryan Tannehill is awful. He's certainly not. Um, he's not a top 10 quarterback. That's for sure. But I, I just, I think Ryan Tannehill gets a lot of hate and, doesn't get the respect he deserves for the good work he's done in recent years. Now, this Monday night game gives me an opportunity to talk about someone who is fantastic. It's Titans running back Derrick Henry. Against Buffalo, Derrick Henry had 20 carries for 143 yards and three touchdowns. It's funny, after this game, my, my Instagram DMs went crazy. People are like, oh my gosh, Derrick Henry went off. Did you see what he did? And... um. It's a bit of a weird comment, but I, and I don't mean to sound unappreciative because I appreciate Derrick Henry and what he's done. He's amazing. But Derrick Henry does that all the time. I wasn't like, whoa, can you see what Derrick Henry's capable of? Because we see it constantly. Like, did anybody, I think a lot of people nationally, Titans fans did, Seahawks fans did. I think most people on a national scale that don't follow Tennessee or Seattle really closely probably didn't watch Titans at Seattle week two, but I watched that game and that's an even better, like Derrick Henry's had an even better performance this year than we saw on Monday Night Football against Buffalo. Uh, you know, Buffalo, great game, but that Seattle game Derrick Henry had at week two was incredible. And that's the word that comes to mind. Derrick Henry is incredible. He had a 76 yard touchdown run up the middle. It's a highlight of the night from this football game. You basically never see a 250 pound man who can outrun everyone else on the football field. That doesn't happen. He's 247 pounds, let's be clear, but that's ridiculous. And Derrick Henry is a throwback to an old era. I mean, he fits in with the 80s and the 90s. I imagine if Derrick Henry played in the 80s or in the 90s. Like, I actually think he might have been better because he would have had more opportunities, would have got the ball more. We play in a very quarterback focused we sorry we play I don't play we watch we are we're witnessing a very quarterback focused NFL right now Derrick Henry's playing he's like the most old school running back playing in a quarterback driven league it's very interesting like I would have loved to see Derrick Henry like it's kind of those they have that Marvel show what if like what if blank what if Derrick Henry had been in the position of Emmett Smith like what would have happened? I, th I think we would have seen even more than what Emmett Smith did. It's very possible. Like, that's blasphemy to some people, but uh, give Derrick Henry the respect he's deserving. And um, I, I just think, man, we're, I can't say enough good things about the way that Derrick Henry plays. The way he runs through contact is incredible. And it's also crazy. You know, Derrick Henry is 27 years old, and which is about the beginning of the end of someone's prime in the NFL, for running back at least. Uh, and I wonder how much longer can Derrick Henry play at a really high level the way he is because the dude is 27, entering, he's in year six right now. And that usually is when a running back will slow down a little bit. But Derrick Henry, 
is showing no signs of slowing down at all. He's amazing. He's in his physical prime. And I'm curious how long will Derrick Henry keep it up? I mean, I, I want to read a, a question on Patreon from Randy. Randy writes in and he says, Hey, Zach, you seem very critical of the Giants for taking Saquon Barkley with a number two pick simply because, quote, a running back shouldn't be taken that high regardless of talent. Do you feel the same about the Jaguars taking Leonard Fournette with the number four pick or the Cowboys trading up to the number four pick to take Ezekiel Elliott or the Rams taking Todd Gurley with the number 10 pick? Where do you feel is the absolute earliest day running back should be drafted? I love that question. Uh, so Derrick Henry is an incredible example of why you do not need a running back in the top 10. Derrick Henry was a second round pick. Don't forget that. And by the way, you talk about Dallas. Dallas had not one, but two opportunities to draft Derrick Henry, and they passed on him twice. Nick Chubb was a second round pick. Joe Mixon was a second rounder. Colts running back Jonathan Taylor was drafted in the second round. Look at the top 10 rushing leaders right now in the NFL. There's two first round picks. We have Najee Harris, who is the uh, number 24 overall pick. He's a rookie right now. I love that pick. We'll talk about why that's okay. And then you have Ezekiel Elliott, who is the number four overall pick. And only one of those guys, that Ezekiel Elliott pick, was a top 10 pick. The other top 10 rushing leaders, so we'll tell you top 11 because Alvin Kamara's in there too, were all, all of them not picked in the first round. Or sorry, eight of the top, nine of the top 11 guys, I don't know, I don't know 12. I know the top 11. So maybe 12 is not a first round pick too, but only two guys in the top 11 in rushing in the NFL right now our former first-round picks. Najee Harris, number 24 overall. Ezekiel Elliott, number four overall. Vikings running back, Dalvin Cook was a second-round pick. Aaron Jones, the Packers running back, was a fifth-round pick. Jaguars running back, James Robinson, went undrafted. Alvin Kamara, one of the most incredible, explosive running backs in the NFL, was a third-round pick. So it's clear and obvious at this point that you can get top talent at the running back position Later in the draft, you do not need to draft a guy, a running back, in the top 10. Where would I be most comfortable drafting a running back? I, I would feel most comfortable drafting a guy like that in the second round. I think a second round is perfect. Get what you... Here's why. And I can be talked into drafting later in the first round. Like the Steelers drafting Najee Harris, number 24 overall. I like that because, hey... By later in the first round, the, the best, most talented players are off the board, and you're just saying, can we find a starter in the first round? That's all your goal is later in the first round. But I would not draft a running back inside the top 10 because you can get more bang for your buck in the top 10. There, there are many, so many other running backs available after the top 10. I don't know why you need to get one there. It, it screams of desperation or uh, a lack of understanding of the rarity of a great offensive lineman or a defensive lineman or a top quarterback or a corner or a safety like running back has so many available players there's just it's ubiquitous there's great running backs all over the place and you can get one in the second round the third round the fourth round, the fifth round you don't need to draft one of the top 10 to get quality if you're drafting in the top 10 you can get a more impactful and more rare player than drafting a running back so yeah Saquon Barkley, Ezekiel Elliott, Leonard Fournette, uh, Todd Gurley, you mentioned. Those are all mistakes, in my opinion. And I understand the hardest one to argue there is Ezekiel Elliott, because Ezekiel Elliott, uh, they went to the playoffs his rookie year, was awesome. He had a big impact immediately. But then realize this. I, I mentioned this earlier. Realize that when, in 2016, Ezekiel Elliott got drafted number four overall, by the Cowboys, who traded up to get him. In that same NFL draft, Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry, went in the second round. The reality is the Cowboys could have drafted a amazing corner, Jalen Ramsey, number four overall, who went number five to the Jaguars. And then in the second round, taken Derrick Henry, number 34 overall. Dallas passed on Derrick Henry, not once, but twice in the 2016 NFL Draft. And I ask you, who would you rather have today? Derrick Henry or Ezekiel Elliott? I would rather have Derrick Henry. 
So, look, in my opinion, drafting a running back in the top 10 is always a mistake. And I just think you can always do better. You can always draft a better, more impactful player. Like, you don't need – why force – why make an unforced error when you don't need to draft a running back in the top 10? You can get other players who can make a better impact. I, I, I look at the Giants. I, I love Saquon Barkley. I, I had to talk to my buddy Joe about this yesterday. Saquon Barkley is an incredible running back. When I criticize the Giants for drafting Saquon Barkley number two overall, I'm not criticizing Saquon Barkley. He's amazing. What I'm criticizing is that they prioritized running back over offensive line. They drafted Saquon Barkley number two and then a guard, Will Hernandez, in the second round. I would have swapped that. I would have drafted Quinton Nelson number two overall because I value linemen more than a running back. And then I would have drafted Nick Chubb number in the second round. And I remember criticizing that at the time. Like, Saquon's a great player, but how good is a running back without help, without a good offensive line? Most of the time, 99% of the time, there's a few exceptions. Most of the time, if you're running back without a great offensive line, it doesn't matter. You're not going to do very well. Now, two Titans players got hurt on Monday night. Uh, Left tackle Taylor Lewan left the game early. He's now in concussion protocol. We'll see if he plays next week during NFL Week 7. It was ugly. Taylor Lewan was out like a light. Uh, it was not pretty. Uh, then number two, Titans corner, first round pick, Caleb Farley towards ACL. I feel horrible for him. Uh, kind of honestly, like it's two first round picks in a row that aren't going to play a lot or pan out very well early on for Tennessee. Caleb Farley's better than the guy they got last year in Tennessee. Uh, but it, it really sucks that Caleb Farley's year is now over. And look, this Titans secondary they're a problem. They, they just are, it, it's a problem that's not going away for Tennessee where they have blown coverages and missed assignments. And it's rough, man. Right now, Tennessee is four and two. They are number one in the AFC South. And the biggest threat to them is the Colts in Indy. Indy is two and four. And there are still 11 games left this year. I'm interested to see, though, can Indy catch Tennessee? You got 11 games. There's a two game difference. Like, it's not baseball, but you're like, oh, Indy is two games back. Can they overcome Tennessee and overtake them? I don't know, but it'll be an interesting like storyline to see how that plays out the rest of the year. Uh, I have two final notes I want to talk about from this game. Number one is very short. I I don't know if I'm the only person out there, and I, I remember like one of my favorite things in the world was designing jerseys in Madden, and I love like all dark, single color jerseys. Whether like usually when I made a, a team in Madden, I made them all black. And then at one point I realized, wait, all black isn't as interesting as all dark. Navy blue is like my favorite color jersey. And the Titans all dark blue NFL jerseys are super cool. It's some of my favorite jerseys in the entire NFL. I love the look. I like how they look with the red the red cleats. It looks fantastic. I want to give a shout out to that because, man, I, I really believe that Tennessee's all dark blue jerseys are and that combo might be, it's one of the most beautiful combos in the entire NFL for a jersey combination. Now, no number two, I want to give a shout out to Bill's tight end, Dawson Knox. He has five touchdown catches this year. He's having sort of a breakout year right now. And uh, he's got a cool story because Dawson Knox uh, played college football at Ole Miss. And he had to walk on to make the team at Ole Miss in college. Didn't do very much there. Part of that was because they had two top receivers DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. Uh, he also didn't have a great quarterback uh, when he was in college. Like Dawson Knox only had 15 catches his final year at Ole Miss. He never caught a touchdown in college. And so to see him emerge into a really good NFL tight end right now, five touchdown catches, like he has a third of a third of as many touchdown catches this year as he had total catches. He's finally year at Ole Miss. It's just he's a guy who was not a star in college who is becoming a really, really good starter in the NFL. And uh, it's just a cool story. Shout out to Dawson Knox. I really like his story. And it's cool to hear that a former walk-on, a guy who wasn't a star in college, has become a really good role player and a very solid starter in Buffalo. All right, guys, I'm going to take a short break. When I return, we will do Ask Zach. I uh, got a good, healthy, long segment today. My name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break. I will be right back all right we are back hope you're doing very very well it's funny i went the entire 
last segment feeling like I needed to take a moment to put like lip balm on. And I'm like, oh, I can't do it. I can't ruin the show. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's my show. If I want to stop and put stinking lip balm on, I'm not live. I could either cut or just be like, hey, y'all, I got to put stuff on my lips. I, <laughs> it's funny how like I forget sometimes like, no, wait, I, I'm the person in charge driving the ship. Uh, it's time for Ask Zach. My favorite part of the show is where I answer questions from you guys, the audience. Uh, in case you do not know how it works, you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Shomler. You give a dollar a month. You can give more if you want to. Please do. It literally helps pay my rent. But a dollar a month is all it takes to get access to submit questions on Patreon. If you submit a question, I do not guarantee to read your question on the show. My only guarantee is I look at every single question with my eyeballs, and I pick the top couple to read on the show. Question number one is from Griffin. He's got a great question. He says, hey, Zach, as you may have heard, the Washington football team retired Sean Taylor's jersey number this weekend. This was announced just a few days before the game and follows their connection to Gruden's emails. Gruden's investigation only came to light because of the Washington football team investigation last year. Additionally, I read that the league had been sitting on this information since summer. Most decent franchises would announce retirement games early before the year, so this comes off as completely disrespectful to Taylor and further delegitimizes the whole organization. Wondering your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's very weird to have someone's jersey retired and then say the organization was disrespecting them. But they were in this case. I mean, it's... The world isn't black and white, and it was very obvious that Washington was deflecting and trying to change the narrative. Like, oh, hey, let's shift focus away from the email controversy and give the media and the fans something else to care about. They announced it three days before the game happened. When has that ever happened? No, it's Washington going, we're in trouble. We need good PR. And it shows the way that billionaires view stuff like that. Like, they can just manipulate us to believe whatever they want us to and it was so low effort and thrown together there's like incredible threads on twitter saying like they put the where, where they put the family the way they did it like it was so it was so low effort it's like it's embarrassing and clearly clearly it was a political move i mean it's it's really of, of course the team in washington would be the team that makes the most political deflection i've ever seen and Man, I don't know. This is where my head goes, and I, I apologize if this bothers anybody or offends anybody. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to. That's certainly not my heart. But I look around at the world right now, and I think that— And this is something I, I was sitting on my, on my bed today thinking, like, what if I found out I, I was, like, riddled with cancer and I was going to die, like, in six months? And I'm like, well, then I would say whatever I wanted. And so this is one of those, like, bucket list things I've always wanted to say is I think one of the biggest problems in our society— is not the it's the divide between financial classes it's that it's it's wealth inequality a billionaire has nothing in common with a millionaire you and i have more in common with a millionaire than a millionaire does with a billionaire billionaires those mother effers do all kinds of stuff to manipulate and get away with stuff and it's it's crazy it's infuriating that they just basically do whatever they want in the world and get away with it because they have tons of money. And uh, this was a situation where Washington's billionaire owners came up with some harebrained idea to pretend to be <laughs> commemorating Sean Taylor, an amazing football player, because they were embarrassed and didn't want attention on their emails. Ugh. And I got to say, like when, when, when those billionaires up in their... Ivory Towers hear us arguing about race and gender. They are grateful. They're like, oh, thank goodness they haven't turned their attention to us. We're, we're the ones not paying anybody anything. We're like doing all this horrible stuff. We're just glad that peasants are fighting with peasants. I think that's really how billionaires feel. And, oh, man, it drives me nuts. It really, uh, I, I hated the way that Washington handled the Sean Taylor situation. Okay, Joe writes in, says, hey, Zach, I hope you're doing well. How legit do you think the Dallas Cowboys are? I know they benefit from being in a trash division, 
but do they strike you as a playoff team or sorry, do they strike you as a team with the potential to go on a deep playoff run? Dude, absolutely. The, the, the Cowboys are not, the question is, will they win a Super Bowl? Not will they have a deep playoff run? I think they can absolutely, like, they have more weaknesses than a team like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think Buffalo or Cleveland or Tampa, like Tampa Bay is the most complete football team in the NFL. And we saw that Dallas is like right there neck and neck with Tampa. So Dallas is really, really good. And it's funny, like I say that Cleveland's a really complete football team. Well, who has a way better quarterback, Dallas or Cleveland? Dallas with Dak Prescott, Dak is monumentally better than Baker Mayfield. Like That's the other thing is, and part of why, I, I, I got to make a video soon about why I was wrong about the Dallas Cowboys. But one of them is that Dak is not only really good, he's even better than I thought. Like, Dak is different in 2021. I mean, he's just a, an amazing quarterback this year. And, like, they need to stay healthy in Dallas. But if they stay healthy, like Zach Martin, that offensive line, which is, is a concern. I mean, they, they have had problems with that offensive line staying healthy in the past. But if they do that, watching the trenches when you watch a Dallas game, the way they can dominate up front is, is ridiculous. And it's like, man, I, I hope people realize that Dallas isn't, like for year, every year, Cowboys fans are like, it's our year. We're going to win a Super Bowl this year. And it's kind of becoming the boy that cried wolf. But this year, it actually is kind of true. You're like, well, it's going to be Arizona or Tampa or Dallas or Green Bay, maybe the Rams. But one of those five teams is going to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. So, yeah, do I buy into Dallas? A hundred percent. I think they're fantastic. And Dak puts them over the top. So I, I think Dallas is certainly capable of winning a Super Bowl and belongs in the conversation. Yes, they're in a weak division, but they can hang with the best in the NFL. And that that kind of, honestly, it excites me. I would love to see Dak Prescott win a Super Bowl. I think what he's been through in his life, his mom dying, his brother dying, getting injured. I mean, how can you not love Dak Prescott? He's so, you know, he wears his heart on his sleeve. He's moving. He's interesting. He's exciting. And I, oh, I, I, I don't like Dallas. Like I, I think Dallas is like a fun city, by the way. But I don't. I don't. The Cowboys are not a team that I. I'm like, oh, awesome. I, I kind of often have enjoyed watching them lose over the years because of their fan base being so loud and obnoxious. But then they got this quarterback, Dak Prescott, and I don't know how you can hate Dak. Like Dak winning a Super Bowl, holding up that trophy. I'd be so happy. Like that would be just a beautiful moment with a guy who has been through so much getting to reach the pinnacle of his career, holding up that trophy. Like oh, that moment even to think about makes me excited. So, uh, and like I talked to a guy, a Giants fan yesterday. I would imagine Giants fans, if Dallas wins the Super Bowl, you're angry, you're furious because you hate the Cowboys, but also tell me you wouldn't feel for Dak, like in your heart, a little bit moved and go, that's pretty cool. That's a guy whose brother took his own life, whose mom died of cancer, who I have no doubt battled depression after getting injured, who man, Dak has dedicated himself and stayed positive and has such a good outlook. And to watch Dak win a Super Bowl would be really, really special. Okay, Teddy writes in and he says, hey, Zach, this isn't really about any current events, but I've always been curious about this question regarding sports hall of fames in general how do you think that playing for a small market team impacts a player's chances to make it to the hall would it make it easier because large market teams theoretically have more success or would it be harder because less people watch small market teams stuff like that so thankfully the nfl hall of fame does not only reward your fame and your stardom like odell beckham jr is a star his name gets talked about everywhere but being notable doesn't mean you're amazing and uh as i put on lip balm being in a big market can help you it probably helped eli manning uh it certainly your name gets out there more but i also do not believe that being in a small market team will hurt you so being in a big market can help you but being in a small market i don't believe can hurt you like Think of uh, Calvin Johnson played for the Detroit Lions, a small market team. 
Tony Gonzalez, Kansas City and Atlanta are where he played. Orlando Pace played in St. Louis as an offensive lineman. The reality is that the NFL Hall of Fame, if you ball out, like, they reward game. They respect what you do. It's not about who you played for. It's about how you played on the field. And uh, I, I can't speak to the NBA Hall of Fame. I can't speak to um, baseball at all. I, I know the NBA better than baseball. And, uh, like, I, I think of maybe Chris Bosh wouldn't be a Hall of Famer if he hadn't played with LeBron James in Miami. Like, that's a big market. He was a superstar a lot of because of where he played and what he did. And he was definitely the weakest link of that big three. So maybe the NBA rewards stardom more than the NFL, but the NFL and that actually, no, you know what though? That doesn't. So I don't, I hate to take away from Chris Bosh. It makes me feel guilty now. It, it actually, all that does is agree with what I said, which is being in a big market can help you, but being in a small market doesn't hurt you. Does that totally, I think that totally makes sense. Like you can have one without the other. And Chris Bosch might have got elevated by Miami, but I don't think that being in a smaller city would have hurt him the same way. It, it I, I just, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, I can't speak in the, in the NBA very much, but I know that in the NFL, they respect how you play, not where you play. Okay. Rachel writes in, she says, no time to die. Uh, by the way, I'm seeing no time to die tonight. I'm very excited. Uh, finally, after it's been out for like three weeks, I'm like, ah, I got money. I'm getting paid. Let's go see the new James Bond movie. Let's be reckless and spend some money. Like life's about experiences, man. I want to see stuff and do stuff. Rachel says, no time to die was Daniel Craig's last time playing James Bond. Who do you think would make a good 007? Idris Elba is the guy that I want to see Idris Elba play James Bond. James Bond doesn't have to be white. He has to be British. I don't know why you can't have... Idris Elba as James. He'd be an amazing. Idris Elba would be an incredible James Bond. Obviously, it's so clear. And I'm like, why? I, I know that uh, when that idea got thrown around a while back, Idris Elba got a ton of hate. I think he actually even said, like, I don't want to ever do it because of, like, I wouldn't want to get ha deal with the racism if, if people were attacking me with all kinds of slurs and bad comments. Like, I'm like, I don't need that in my life. So I'm not sure that Idris Elba would do it if it got asked to do it. But I. I'm all in. If Idris Elba was James Bond, him in the suit, like he'd be ama he'd be amazing as James Bond. I can see it. And uh, I, oh, man, you know, it's, it's James Bond, the British version of Batman. That's ba is that basically what you would equate it to? Because we've had all kinds of Batmans, and we've had all kinds of james bonds and then maybe doctor who is spider-man I, I don't know that's a weird parallel maybe they don't parallel but it is interesting like we have these iconic characters that we just recast over to over and over again uh with new people it, it's a fun thought I, I mentioned something i said you know you want to have experiences it's not like i don't believe in saving money like i totally do i just there's a line i i like i really want to own a house someday i've got a great idea to build a tiny home and it's got a studio and i'll make the podcast and I, I really, I want to, I know that sounds crazy, but like, I think for like a hundred thousand dollars, which I think I can get a hundred thousand dollar loan, um, and then pay, you know, make payments on it. I want to get a tiny home really badly and put it somewhere out here in Hawaii. And that's, that's all like doable. Like that's, that's cheaper than buying a house. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. I really can. And that's like a dream I have. And I, I'm, I'm saving for that. But also like, I don't want to live my whole life only saving and thinking about the future and never enjoying the small moments. And so. Um, tonight I'm going to go to, you know, watch Daniel Craig, his final send off as James Bond tomorrow. We're going to go see Dune, uh, date nights tomorrow. We're going to go to dinner. I think I'm going to try to go to IHOP tomorrow or maybe tonight. Fiance would not like to go to IHOP for date night, but I, I've been craving IHOP for weeks and, uh, like, you know, when you get paid and you're like, ah, all this stuff I've been waiting to spend money on. That's how I'm feeling right now. I haven't gotten, I've been living paycheck to paycheck for a long time. Now my first paycheck from NFL season, which is a little bit more than normal. I'm like, Oh Yes. Finally, I can, uh, I'm ashamed to say this, but I can spend money that I haven't had in my budget for a long time. I'm like, finally, that'll be so fun to go to IHOP. Like I, I want a stinking waffle. I'm, I'm so ready for a waffle and, uh, I'm, I'm, we're far away from home on an Island. I go swimming every day. That's great. But I miss home and that's something that'll remind me of home and my dad. And I don't know, I'm rambling now, but the Chevy writes in, I, I think it's, a, it, it's T S C H U E B I to Chevy. I think is how you say that says, hi, Zach. As a Dolphins fan, it's not easy these days. 
after losing to the Jaguars, do you think it is time that some changes are made? It seems like this game was 100% on the coaching staff with Tua over 300 yards passing and the offensive line providing decent protection. So do you think it is too early to say that Brian Flores is on the hot seat and so is Chris Greer? Have a great day and keep up the amazing content. I have a lot to say here. Uh, so there's rumors of a Sean Watson trade, and that feels desperate to me. Like, first of all, why is that coming out? I, I think what that is is the Houston Texans saying, hey, we're going to trade into Miami unless someone steps up and makes a better offer. Because I, I think the trade is going to be very favorable towards Miami. Where I think I think Houston's going to have to give up to Sean Watson for very little because of the allegations against him and the it, hope, uh, minimum a suspension, if not worse, coming towards Deshaun Watson. Um, you're innocent until proven guilty. I, I, let's be clear, but it doesn't look good if you're Deshaun Watson at all. Like a man. Uh, and I, I think a lot of this, first of all, I, I, let me address Tua because I, I think it's worth saying. I've said it before. I want to say it again. It's too early to give up on Tua. I believe that. The only argument you can make that justifies getting rid of Tua is if you say, well, we don't like his potential, you know, his arm strength, his ability to run around. Even if Tua does get better, that's not good enough for what we want. That makes sense to me. But to just say he's not going to get better is nonsense because you haven't given him time or enough weapons around him to give him a chance to even get better. So don't say Tua won't get better. Say if Tua does get better, we're not going to be happy with that. We want someone with higher potential. That makes sense. I think everyone can get on board with that. Now, the Dolphins have really regressed this year. Is it because Tua's been playing? Well, Tua got hurt, so uh, no Ryan Fitzpatrick, Joe Kobe Brissett. Like, I don't know. It's clear the team, I haven't watched enough Dolphins football to say why they've regressed. We should probably do a film analysis after the year to talk about what happened. But to have 10 wins last year and then start 1-5 this year, you're not going to get to 10 wins again this year. There's no way. And so 100%, I think everybody in Miami is on the hot seat. I, Brian Flores was on the hot seat going into the year. Unless I saw all kinds of rumors like Brian Flores is one of the coaches who might get fired if things go bad this year. And I'm like, I remember thinking, what are you talking about? Because Brian Flores won 10 games last year. And now I'm like, oh, I, I still don't know what the argument was for putting Brian Flores on the hot seat after last year. But at least I'm starting to go, it's because he's not winning. That makes sense. So, I don't know. Anthony writes in and says, Hey, Zach, I know it's the middle of the football season, so you may not be keeping up much with the MLB playoffs, but could you please say something nice about my Atlanta Braves? It's been a roller coaster year with the lowest of lows, losing our superstar, not having our best young pitcher, a domestic violence arrest, and now to be two games from a World Series is unreal. Feels like a Hollywood script. Any thoughts on the Braves or anything else related to the incredible MLB postseason? Uh, so I I'm recording this at uh, 11.30 East Coast time. So in a couple hours from now, the Braves will play for an opportunity to make it into the World Series. They're up in the series 3-1. to one. And uh, I believe they're going to... I think the Braves are going to win the NLCS tonight and uh, advance to the World Series. It's been such a cool run. I, I do follow baseball. I don't cover baseball because it's like impossible to cover. I kind of have grown frustrated with trying to cover it because you talk about one day and by the time you talk about Tuesday, it's already Thursday and it's moved on and no one cares about like, it's, it's just too, I can't maybe I've talked about maybe doing like a monthly baseball podcast where I'm like, here's what's happening in baseball and, and like a monthly check-in that might be kind of fun. Um, but right now I'm like, I just maybe next year. I don't know. But I remember when Ronald Acuna got hurt. I thought the Braves season was over. I'm like, okay, well, uh, that's it. And so now to be one game away from the World Series, probably going to make the World Series tonight. Uh, this, I, Who knows? This might come out after they've already made it in. Um, what a cool run. And, and and I really want Atlanta versus Boston in the World Series. I, I hate Houston. I don't want the Astros to have any success. And uh, I hate that they're leading the Red Sox in that series. I'm like, oh, of course. Um but I, I, I really want to see – look, Atlanta, the Braves would be a really, really cool story if they won the World Series this year. They've overcome a lot, and uh, it's been really fun to watch that team like build momentum and succeed the way they have. Okay, Sean writes in, says, Disappointed Browns fan, 
If you were to offer Baker a contract right now, what would it be? So how much money would I pay to the Browns quarterback, Baker Mayfield? Um, here's the thing. Baker has been solid, but just solid, not great. And I, I asked this question. If you don't give Baker big money, what's he going to do? Like, is, is Baker going to leave? Is he going to, where's he going to go? And, and now, Cleveland, no one in Cleveland has the audacity to, like, take the only good quarterback they've had in literal years and let that guy walk away. Because he could pull a Kirk Cousins and just leave. Uh, but I I would love to have a conversation with Cleveland. I, I never, I don't have access to that. But what if you offered him a two-year, $40 million deal? Two years, four zero forty million dollars fully guaranteed and then look here's my argument if, if baker's not gonna play great i can't afford to pay baker like a great quarterback because we need to build a good team around him like does baker want to win because we got to get baker help unless he plays better you give a two-year deal to baker mayfield because it gives you two years to see how he does and then renegotiate and give him more money. If he plays great, it's like, I want to pay Baker, but he hasn't earned a Dak Prescott contract. He hasn't earned a massive contract. So it'd be fair to him to say, Hey, look, we'll give you money fully guaranteed, which is really in your favor, but it's a two year deal, which helps you because, um, this price is good for us, but the length is good for you. Where if you play good in two years, you get another contract. It's a, it's a balance of a team-friendly deal, two years, $40 million, but fair to him because it gives him a shot to prove himself and get more money, and it's fully guaranteed. I'm crazy. I acknowledge that would not fly because it's too little money, and it's Cleveland who's desperate for a quarterback. They're probably going to give him a massive contract. But I, I still think what I, everything I just said is really well thought out. Two years to prove himself, $40 million guaranteed to say, hey, you've done better than most guys here, and we respect you and want to give you money without any strings attached. And you got two years to prove that you're better and earn more money. But again, Baker, let's be frank. If you're not going to play better and make plays at the end of the game and avoid turnovers and stop fumbling, then we got to build a great team around you to elevate you. And I would say that to his face if I'm the GM, say, look, Baker, if you're not going to play better, we got to get you more help. So we can't pay you $40 million a year. We got to pay you 20 a year because we got to get other players around you if we want to win. And we want to win a Super Bowl. Do you? Because we're not going to win a Super Bowl, Baker, if we pay you $40 million a year. It's going to cripple our franchise. No offense to you, buddy, but I need you to have receivers to throw to. And if you have that con- – like, I, I just – I don't know how that would go down. I, I But I, that thought – is really fun. How would that go? Probably not well. Baker would probably get angry and feel offended. <laughs> but man, like I, that's, that's a thought. It would take good people skills to pull off a deal like that. But you could if you did it the right way, I'm convinced. And uh, man, I, I, love, I, love, I love that thought. That's why I talk about sports as hypotheticals. I love thinking about what if? And uh, what if you offered Baker a two-year deal worth 40, 40, 40 million dollars fully guaranteed. I don't know. Connor writes in. Connor says, man, Zach, what is going on with Mahomes? I've always said that Andy Reid, Travis, Kelsey, and Tyreek Hill really help sweep Mahomes' flaws under the table. I think he would be a lot worse on another team. It seems like he wants to play. It seems like he wants every play to be a touchdown or a huge play. What do you think? Um... Connor, love you, man. I think you might be, it's a little bit of confirmation bias. You're like, well, I think, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make, I don't want to make fun of you. Um, no, I, I, and by the way, that probably sounded like I, I didn't mean to offend you at all. I, I, but I, I think Mahomes is fine. Patrick Mahomes, the Chiefs quarterback. What you're seeing, Connor, is a, a quarterback who's been given freedom to experiment I and mean, to take risks and, most quarterbacks would get benched or in trouble for trying the stuff that Mahomes does every week. 
He had a play last week where he's rolling to the right, throws it all the way across the field to Tyree Kill, and you're like, and by the way, I don't throw a football like that if you're watching. He throws it all the way across the field, <laughs> back to his left. It's ridiculous. And, and I'm not kidding. I think Baker might get taken out of the game if he tried that throw. Like, there are certain... Tua ain't making that throw because he's the leash is too short. So, like, man, part of why Mahomes can do what Mahomes does is because Andy Reid and that coaching staff at Kansas City have said, we're just going to let this guy... Like, training wheels are off. We're letting this guy go crazy. No limitations. Let him do whatever he wants. And you cannot and should not stifle the creativity of Patrick Mahomes. Like... Part of why, like, I know people get annoyed when Mahomes is all over ESPN's Instagram feed and you're like, all they do is post about Patrick Mahomes. It's because he does stuff that's unbelievable. That, like, Matthew Stafford has done some of the stuff that Mahomes does, but not everything. And Mahomes does stuff every single week where you're like, that's amazing. And a lot of the stuff he does has never been done before. (laughs) He's, He's put together a whole career doing stuff that most people have never even attempted. So, look, I, I think Mahomes is good not just for him, but and, like, letting Mahomes be creative is not just good for him. It's good for the sport of football. Like, think of how much Patrick Mahomes' style of play is evolving the game of football. I watch the throws that high school quarterbacks are starting to make, and I'm like, that that's something that Mahomes would do. He's changing thought process he's giving people permission to do other stuff you you can if no one's open just extend the play and and then reverse pivot if you make a guy miss and like Mahomes plays flag football every week at an NFL level and don't tell me that's not good for the game it's entertaining it's fun and what it does is pushes the game forward so I don't know I I I think that Is Mahomes bad? No, he's on a worse team than he's had ever. He's probably forcing it a little bit to try to win, but Mahomes is fine. He's just, again, he's he's playing free and easy, and YOLO, he's he's trying to make stuff happen. So I I don't, I think anyone who's critical of Mahomes is is being too, um, too cautious and too quick of a trigger to get after Patrick Mahomes and not appreciate what he does. And, uh, I, I intentionally don't cover Patrick Mahomes very much because I, I get kind of bored of his play. He's amazing. Like, it's kind of boring to every week say, he's amazing again. I probably should talk about him more, but I find it more interesting to talk about why did the Chargers lose to the Ravens? What happened to Tua? What happened to Patrick Mahomes? Oh, Davis Mills, a rookie quarterback beat Bill Belichick. That's amazing. And I end up ignoring Mahomes, but Mahomes is incredible. And, and like enough people cover Patrick Mahomes every week. I don't need to add nothing. I need to add to that to say, but if you want me to talk about Mahomes, it's the, the best thing about him is that Andy Reid has given him the freedom to do whatever he wants and make mistakes and permission to take risks. And when you take risks, you also hit sometimes. And so, uh, and he hits more often than not. So I don't know. I digress. Joshua writes in, Joshua says, Hey, Zach, Oh, by the way, this is an old one from from last week. Joshua says, hey, Zach, I really liked your comment slash interview where you talk about letting your young quarterback make mistakes and take risks without fear of being benched. Kind of goes right into the last question. What do you think about Lincoln Riley's decision to bench Spencer Rattler in the middle of the game against Texas? Obviously, the outcome worked out for OU, but I wasn't sure how to feel since I agreed so strongly with your attitude towards young quarterbacks just earlier that week. So yeah, I had a conversation with uh, Portland State quarterback coach John Eagle. He talked about how you got to let your guys make, you got to give guys freedom to make mistakes, and let's not yell and scream at them all the time. Let's let's have an environment that is conducive to a quarterback being comfortable. And when they're scared to pull the trigger on a vertical, that's not good. You need to have a guy who's not afraid of losing his job based on one mistake. Here's the thing, though, Joshua. Spencer Rattler did not make one mistake and lose his job. It wasn't one bad game, and then he got benched. It was a series of bad games with poor play and underwhelming play and bad decisions, and he had a really long fuse. Like, kind of, you ever seen like a an old Tom and Jerry cartoon where you light a fuse and there's like this little string, like 
Yeah, there's this little rope, and you see the the ignition like run down the string. Well, Spencer Rattler's fuse was like a mile long. It wasn't like one mistake and quick trigger, you fire him. It was like, no, we gave this guy opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and he he wasn't making it happen against Texas, and that was the final straw. They're like, we can't win this way. We have to go to Caleb Williams, our other quarterback, and that might help us win, and it did. So I, I actually, because it, like, I would hate to see Spencer Rattler get benched if he made one bad play. That's not fair to him. But he was given multiple games to figure it out and didn't. And I had no problem with it. In fact, I loved it because there has to be consequences and accountability for bad play, especially if you're a quarterback. If your quarterback isn't getting the job done, like I would, I, I'm curious, will Detroit ever bench Jared Goff? How loud of a statement would that be to your franchise? Like, hey, we're going to bench even our quarterback, our highest paid guy. If you don't figure it out and play better, your job is not safe. We'll pay Jared Goff to sit on the bench because we think we can win with better play. And if it's not, not going to come from Jared Goff, we got to move on. So, like, I had a guy who was really mad at me because I suggested moving on from Jared Goff. He's like, well, you got to look at their Jared Goff's massive contract. They would never. Here's a radical thought if your quarterback is making you lose games, don't play him, get a new quarterback. Jared Goff is costing Detroit wins in the NFL. Unacceptable. I don't care how much money you make. If you're costing me games, I'm putting you on the goddamn bench, the GD bench. I'm like, I'm moving on. Sorry, dude. Yeah, I pay you too much. Overpay you. I'm frustrated with how much I pay you. And we can't cut you because it'll cost us money still. So you're going to sit on the bench. But I'm not going to play you because you're so bad. You're making us lose football games. That's what I would say to Jared Goff if I drafted Malik Willis and benched him. Communicate. Be honest. And, and look, you got to tell Jared Goff now, dude, if you're not going to figure it out, we're going to replace you. you got to play better. Stop turning over the ball. Stop having costly mistakes in the red zone. So, yeah, I'm, I'm interviewing a quarterback in 15 minutes, and, and that's something I should talk about with him is that idea of getting benched. Um Carter writes in, he says, you've been dealing with that jackhammer for weeks now. Is your frustration building? If so, let it all out through sports. Give us some negative takes. Ryan Daniel sucks. The Seahawks should tear down the team and ship out Wilson so they don't follow in the Lions' footsteps. Call a few rookies and sophomores at players draft busts. Let's hear what you've got. But probably follow this segment up with something positive. It would be weird to finish the show with negativity. Yes, we actually, you know, I read this question and I, I sat down and I wanted to read it because I wanted to share just some kind of personal note is that I honestly have no complaints in my life. <laughs> like like I, there, there's construction downstairs. It's going to start here soon, a couple hours from now. I have to record. Literally, I literally have to record while it's dark outside in the middle of the night to, record, to avoid sledgehammer noises and jackhammer noises downstairs because they're demolishing an apartment downstairs and renovating it. So that sucks. I don't, I don't like dealing with a, a, a sledgehammer and a jackhammer. But I've never been happier. Yeah, the jackhammer is annoying, but overall, life is great. Uh, it's warm. I've got a beautiful, amazing, kind fiance who makes great food and is wonderful and smart and makes me a better person. And I got these, I've got these cats. I love my cats, dude. My, my cats are Tucker and Mac, orange and a, a black and white cat. Man. Mackie was abused, our little boy, and uh, he he was abused as a kitten. It was really sad. He used to like be terrified of us, and now he's growing into this little cat who is so comfortable with us and trusts us. And he lays on his back, just like spread eagle, he's so happy. And I'm like, man, I that's what life's about. I'm, I'm a positive guy. I I hate complainers. I uh, it's better to like. Here's my advice from this. Uh, how I'll, I'll close it here is that. Find reasons to be happy rather than finding reasons to complain or not be happy. You can always find a reason to be unhappy and you can always find a reason to be happy. It's a choice. Like depression happens. I've been depressed. I've dealt with depression a lot where you have a chemical imbalance or you have days where you just don't feel good and you can't figure out why. But I'll tell you what, it does help to focus on the positive stuff that you can be grateful for. Like, my studio is not perfect. I, I'm literally, I have a tote behind me. I've got totes in front of me. I have the, it's a mess. I'm still figuring out. I'm about, I'm hopefully going to get a shelf tonight. 
It'll change my studio loud. I'm really excited about it. But like, instead of complaining about how things aren't perfect, why not look about, why don't I pick something I like about my studio and go, that's awesome. How about the fact that it's warm? I got this amazing shoe horse around me. Like I, you can always find a reason to be happy if you look hard enough. And that's my challenge to anybody listening is find reasons to be positive and enjoy your life rather than being negative. Braden writes in, he's pretty negative. He says, this is now the final straw. I could take the loss to Baltimore. I could take the loss to Pittsburgh. Barring massive changes needed. However, I simply cannot take the loss to the Raiders yesterday, especially after the week they had. Meaning the Raiders firing their coach, John Gruden. Uh, and the loss yesterday being Denver, the Broncos losing to the Raiders. Vic Fangio and the entire coaching staff let an interim head coach come into their building and completely embarrass them. I just have to ask you who you think would be the best fit for the next head coach of the Broncos because it's going to be coming sooner rather than later. Thank you. Who's next? I don't know. Um, ho- hopefully someone who wants to actually drop a quarterback finally. Um, but I, I don't know. It, it's Maybe Vic Fangio is the guy to bring in Aaron Rodgers because Vic Fangio did dominate Aaron in Chicago. So maybe Aaron respects Vic Fangio and they trade for Aaron Rodgers. That, that's possible. I don't know. Um, it's just sad. This is what I want to say about the Broncos. It's sad to see them lose and not win against good football teams because this roster so clearly has so much potential and, and watching them fail is, is painful. Okay, we have one, two questions left. Devin writes in, he says, Devin says, hey, Zach, I brought up the topic on one of my live streams, and the responses came in so many different flavors. Steelers cornerback Joe Hayden couldn't come to an agreement for a contract extension after his after this year, meaning he'll be a free agent after this season. There's questions about Jordan Love's future in Green Bay. I think you see where I'm going with this. The Packers are cornerback needy, and the Steelers are quarterback needy. With a trade deadline coming soon, how would you feel about a trade involving Jordan Love and Joe Hayden? Well, it's highly unlikely to happen. I think it's a move that makes sense for both sides. The Packers are in win-now mode, while the Steelers, whether they realize it or not, are not in the conversation for a championship. Personally, I'd love the trade. How do you feel? It's a fun idea. Green Bay would never do it. Um, Like, and I I don't know that I would do it if I was Green Bay. Um, First of all, you you can't trust that Aaron Rodgers won't retire after this year or just leave, you know, and, and not, and abandon your franchise. So if you want a future, you got to keep Jordan Love. Jordan Love is the backup plan and the future in Green Bay. I would not trade away my future. And, and most likely, and most likely, more likely, and what's more valuable to Green Bay, what could happen for the Steelers is that, I said Green Bay, I meant what's more, what's more likely for the Steelers and what they could do is they should trade for Gardner Minshew or Tua Tungavaloa. Gardner's with the Philadelphia, Tua's with Miami. Go get one of those guys. Uh, but Green Bay, I think, would rather be – they don't care about winning a Super Bowl this year. Like, not really. They'd like to. Uh, they're not going to trade their future for a Super Bowl this year. Green Bay would rather be good for 15 more years with Jordan Love and not win a Super Bowl than win a Super Bowl this year and have misery for – because what's more financially successful? being good for the next 15 years and keeping that carrot on the end of the stick, letting your fan base think you have hope of another Super Bowl. So they want to stay relevant for money's sake. So Green Bay ain't trading Jordan Love anytime soon. It's a, it's an interesting idea. It would be like cool to see Jordan Love get unleashed with Pittsburgh, but it's not going to happen. Ultimate A says, hey, Zach, there's a few episodes ago, but I'm really interested in that story you told of the quarterback coach who only yelled and screamed at his players for one specific thing. But he left everything else alone and extended the same wisdom to his fellow position coaches. This made me curious. If you were a position coach on for each of the positions, what would your one thing be you would yell at your players for? It doesn't necessarily have to be every position group, but since you have a detailed background at quarterback, maybe just tackle that. Thanks for the work you do. Ultimate A. Ultimate A, great question. Phenomenal. Uh, even the way you worded that was like really well done. I'm trying to – my one thing that I, I would – try to almost never yell at my players. I think there's a much better, more effective way to communicate. I feel bad. I yell at my fiance sometimes and we're like, we're usually it's cause I'm, I'm nervous that something is going to happen. I'm like, Oh my God, don't get that wet. I'm like, ah, and I, cause then I feel like rushed time wise. And I'm like, I need to say this before something bad happens. Right. I feel horrible when I yell. And, um, again, there's just a better way 
to communicate more effectively where people can actually hear what you're saying. One thing I would have a really hard time being patient with is when a guy doesn't know the playbook. Like, you got to know the playbook. You got to know what your job is on every play. Being prepared is always a choice, and you should always know your job. It's non-negotiable, and uh, that's the one thing. Like, you don't know the route? You don't know your job as the corner and cover two? Like, dude, get to the flat. Jam him at the line of scrimmage and then play the flat. And if number two carries vertical, go with him. It's not that hard. Like, I, that's the kind of stuff I would be like, how do you not know the play call and what you're supposed to do on that play call? Like, that's just you not preparing hard enough. Now, you also, the thing is, even that, though, if you're like a high school football coach, guys have class. Like, they're, they're trying to do science and chemistry and math. And I guess science and chemistry are the same thing. They've, they've got a lot of stuff going on, and their kids trying to enjoy their lives. So, I don't know, man. You want to have accountability. You want to have guys on their same page. I think the best way, if you want a team to dominate your playbook and not ever screw up, is have a simple playbook where it's not that hard to learn. And then, okay, <laughs> you know what to do every play. That's my thought. Um, but Guys, I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, I do need to go. In, in six minutes, I'm interviewing a quarterback, Riley Hennessy, who won the Italian Super Bowl last year, plays football in Europe. He's a great quarterback. Uh, I need to end this episode and set up for that. But I love you. I appreciate you. I got like three interviews coming out very soon. So you're amazing. Uh, I'm recording after Thursday Night Football. We'll talk about that game. We'll talk about hopefully the Chargers and Ravens. We'll talk about, um, geez, what's the uh, college football preview that? Let's talk about the NFL week. Let's top stories there. I also got to go to date night. Uh, I want to, I've got a bunch of topics I want to record that I haven't even, I have ideas. I, I've, I, it's, it's a pain in my life. I always have ideas and I can never flesh them out as much as I want. Like I, I've got like 30 ideas I wanted to talk about this week and this episode took so long to make and, and just lots of stuff going on. And, um, ah, man, I, I, it's a good problem to have. I always have more to say than I can possibly say. So I love you. I appreciate you. I will see you next time. But um bum bam, we are done.